The art academies uh, began in France in the 1600s under Louis XIV with the French Royal Academy of Painting. Uh, but art academies were imitated all over the world. And the way art academies worked was they, they basically um, sort of controlled what kinds of art artists could produce. So every year in France, for instance, there was a big event called the Grand Salon. This is a huge art show, and if you wanted to be uh, have your art seen by the general public, then you had to submit paintings, and they had to be accepted. Uh, and this is an example of an art show of a Grand Salon from 1785. Um, but basically, there were rules, and if your paintings didn't fit one of these categories, then you weren't allowed in. So what were the rules? Well, first of all, your art had to be about certain subjects and there was kind of a hierarchy of subjects and if your art was a what we call a history painting so if it was a historical biblical or mythological scene then well, that was kind of considered the greatest form of art. And these were usually large-scale paintings. Think of these as kind of the big blockbuster movies of their day. But there were sort of uh, categories underneath. There were portraits, there were genre paintings, landscapes, still lifes. You know, below that would be like animal paintings. So if you painted sort of like biblical scenes or mythological scenes or historical scenes on a grand scale, you, you were a, a history painter and you were kind of considered the top. But if you didn't choose one of these categories, it was very uh, likely that your art wouldn't be accepted at all. Also, if you didn't paint one of the accepted styles, so in this case, Romanticism or cla Neoclassicism, then you, you, if you tried to do something outside of that, sort of something experimental or something new, then you weren't going to get accepted. There were also rules and limitations against women uh, um, being allowed. In some countries, women weren't allowed at all into academic shows. In others, uh, like in France, they had sort of a cap. They had a limit of how many they could add. But uh, after the French Revolution, the sort of um, influence of the art academy uh, start to sort of dwindle, but it's still going to be a huge uh, presence in European art. Well, throughout into even the early 20th century. And this is a typical academic painting. This kind of, um, uh, in many ways, it's nothing really new, is it? It's, it's basically art that we have been seeing produced since the Renaissance. It's m Greek mythological themes, which have at this point been popular for uh, you know, 400 years since the Renaissance into the mid 1800s. It's an image. It's a um, image where the central subject is the nude human figure. Yet again, another very traditional kind of subject, and it's painted in a very Renaissance sort of style, using linear perspective and using chiaroscuro and all of the sorts of rules of art that had been established 400 years prior. And so a lot of artists are feeling that this, this kind of art doesn't matter anymore. It's old-fashioned, it it's, doesn't have anything to do with the modern world or real life or people's real everyday struggles or anything real. Notice I keep using that word. Because there's a movement that begins in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s that is called realism. It begins in France, and it is concerned with social change. It's concerned with the inequality of the, of the poor. Although, it, in general, it didn't always have a social political stance. It, sometimes it often did, and, and, and certainly it was about real life. It was about everyday struggles, and that's why we call it realism. You're going to notice that this art doesn't look real in like a photographic sense, but it's real in the, in the sense that it's about everyday people's lives. Um, we're also going to be introduced to a topic called the avant-garde. This is a French military term which meant the forward guard. These are the guys on the front line who are in the most dangerous place. But in modern art, we, we use this term to talk about trailblazing artists, artists who want to push the boundaries of uh, what is uh, sort of the rules and to rebel very often against the status quo and against the way they feel things uh, are, have always been done, um, because now those old-fashioned things don't seem so relevant. And avant-garde um, implies art that is, is constantly looking forward and pushing the boundaries and often pushing the sort of rules and, mor and mores and, uh, of society. 
Um, so we will definitely see a, a you know, a, a kind of rebellion uh, going on through the modern period. So this is a key realist work. It's called The Stonebreakers, and it's by the key realist painter, uh, Gustav Courbet. Uh, Gustav Courbet chose not to paint big mythological, biblical, or historical scenes, but instead he took the subject of two workers, a, a boy and an old man, breaking rocks. He took a segment of society that is normally ignored or forgotten or even shamed, and he painted it on a large scale and on a heroic way in the same way that a traditional painter would have painted an image from Greek mythology or the Bible. Because for... In, in some ways, for, for Corbet, these people are the heroes. Corbet comes from the country. He grew up around peasants and field hands and workers, and he was interested in their struggles. And he was interested in, in, in the inequalities of life. You know, this is sort of the rise of socialism throughout Europe, and for the first time, uh, workers are really starting to assert themselves. And a lot of this comes with industrialization and mass production and factories and uh, the really poor treatment that a lot of workers at this time were experiencing. And um, socialism was a a field of political thought that was very inviting to a lot of people who, uh, a lot of workers who felt they were, um, uh, could gain some power uh, th through this new, new system. Uh, now, whether that worked or not, certainly history uh, shows us that it wasn't always successful, but um, uh, it, it was, it's certainly an important development in this time. And um, uh, Corbet is kind of reflecting these, these concerns. Uh, and people were horrified by this painting when it was shown at the Grand, shown at the Grand Salon because it's not your typical painting. It took the subject matter of, of, of people who are often forgotten or ignored in society and it blows them up on this kind of heroic scale. And for Courbet, that's the point. Very famously, Courbet was asked, um, why don't you paint angels? In other words, the, the interviewer was asking him, why don't you do these biblical scenes or historical scenes or mythology? And Corbet just looks at the guy and says, if you show me an angel, I will paint you one. But as of right now, I don't see any angels. What I see are people working hard and getting paid very little. What I see are people struggling and not making ends meet and living in horrible conditions and poverty and wearing rags for clothes. Corbet also chose to paint in a very unfinished, gritty style. He used a device called a palette knife uh, to spread on and smear on the paint. You can see it here, especially on the ground, in a very uh, sort of unrefined kind of way. He paints with this thick sort of impasto, but it's in a way like this gritty sort of style of painting reinforced this sort of gritty subject matter. Uh, and so while this painting offended and shocked some, uh, for others it was a revelation. It, it was a breath of fresh air because it sort of painted the real world. It painted the concerns that a lot of people had in their minds. And it, it showed a, 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 popular, a segment of society that had often been forgotten by the world of fine art. Um, realism is a movement that is not just in France, but it ends up spreading through Europe and even into America. This is an American artist named Henry Osawa Tanner, who was an African-American artist and had trouble making uh, his career as an artist here in his United, in native United States because of segregation and because of um, well, racism, to be honest with you. And he found a much more open, receptive audience in France, where he moves, and he as ex exposed to the work of Courbet. And like Courbet, he painted everyday life. And like Courbet, he painted what he knew. Courbet grew up in rural France and painted the peasants and field hands of that area. And Henry Osawa Tanner grew up, um, you know, in African-American community in the United States. And he painted, um, you know, people who were his friends and neighbors and uh, people like that, um, painting sort of everyday scenes. Uh, once again, in this very sort of rough, kind of unfinished style, very much influenced by Courbet. Courbet eventually rejects the Academy altogether. In 1855, Courbet decided not to submit any works of his to the Academy uh, uh, that year, to the big Grand Salon, and instead opened up his own 
basically rented uh, rented a tent, set it up across from the salon at the Louvre, and uh, had his own show. And he called it the Pavilion of Realism, and it was. Um, a huge success eventually, uh, and it inspired a lot of other artists to realize, yeah, I don't need the Academy. We can be successful without the Grand Salon. In fact, people are looking for work that isn't like academic painting. And that leads us to Edward Manet. Manet is an incredibly important and influential modern artist. In many ways, he really embraces this idea of the avant-garde. Art that is meant to push boundaries and push buttons. Art that is meant to shock and is meant to expose segments of society that are not normally uh, portrayed in art. And he did this in this incredibly important painting called Luncheon on the Grass, Déjeuner sur l'herbe, uh, which was actually not shown at the Academy, but shown at a salon called the Salon des Refusés, the Salon of the Refused. Napoleon III, the, the, the ruler of France at the time, um, realized there were so many people who were sort of hungry for art that was rejected by the Grand Salon that they opened up a companion show that showed all of the art that was refused. Now a lot of this art was shown simply because it wasn't very good, but some of it was just not, it was shown because it didn't fit into the categories or the styles accepted by the Academy. And this was a painting that caused a huge scandal at the time. And it all had to do with the nudity of the woman uh, in the center of the painting. Now you be at, might, might be asking yourself, well, didn't we just look at an academic painting that um, you know, had, had a nude image of Venus? Well, yeah, absolutely, we sure did. And in fact, this painting itself, um, Manet borrowed... Uh, imagery from two very famous Renaissance painting, a painting by Titian and a print, I should say not a painting, by uh, Raimonde who was uh, copying a work of the artist Raphael. So both of these works, well the, the Raimonde Raphael work is a, an image of Greek mythology. This is a work um, more of kind of a fantasy sort of image. And you can see where Manet directly copied the position of the figures and the overall kind of themes um, of, of both of these images. So why are these two upper images okay, but Manet's was so shocking? Well, it has to do with the fact that this is a modern setting, and this isn't some mythological figure. This isn't a Venus or a personification like Lady Liberty or something, but this is just a naked woman. Uh, a woman named Victorine Moran, who was um, also a, a prostitute and who uh, would have been, uh, people would have been, um, she was, and this, and this in itself uh, was, was shocking. But more shocking than anything was the way she is looking at the viewer. She is not behaving like nude models traditionally behaved, either sort of demurely looking away or looking at the viewer kind of seductively, but instead she's confrontational because this woman knows exactly what we're looking at. We are looking at her body. We are looking at her body because it's titillating. And she understands that. And in a way, she's kind of calling us out on it. She is sort of confronting us with the fact that we are staring at her. She's not just letting, laying there passively, kind of letting herself be objectified. And this in itself is, it was shocking because basically it meant that she was calling us all a bunch of hypocrites. Because Manet knew this would painting would be shocking. That's why he painted it. And he knew it would be shocking because of the nudity the nudity of a modern woman. And he's saying, look, we're okay with nudity if you call it Greek mythology, or if you call it a biblical image, or if you say it's a personification of some sort of abstract concept. But as soon as you turn that, that nude into a naked modern woman who is ex aware exactly of the fact that the reason we have all of these pictures of nude people in our 400 history, year history of art since the Renaissance is not because 
it's, it's emotionally or intellectually or philosophically stimulating. We have all these naked people because we like looking at naked people and we should just admit it. And that disturbed people. That shocked them. That exposed their hypocrisy. But not only did, was Manet sort of calling us out for looking at, at, at liking to look at nudity, um, he was also um, sort of throwing under the bus, throwing away really, all of the rules of, of Renaissance art in terms of design and the application of paint. Look at the woman in the background. If you compare her to the trees and especially this boat near her, you'll realize that she is massive. She is way too big for the image. And the reason Manet did this is because he is throwing away the rules of linear perspective. Those rules... The, he is throwing away the rules of linear perspective. Those rules that have been in play since the Renaissance. And he's basically saying, I'm not going to follow those rules. Um, why? Because I don't want to. Because this is a painting, and painting doesn't have to follow the rules of nature and reality. Painting can be whatever I want it to be. And if I want to make this woman bigger than she should be because it makes a better picture and you can see her more clearly, I am going to do that. And he also did this with the background. If you look at the way he's painted, especially the grass, he's not even pretending this is grass. This just looks like a bunch of smeary fingerprint, finger paints <laughs> put on by a five-year-old. And he's, in a way, almost emphasizing the artificiality of a painting. He's emphasizing the fact that it's not real. Isn't it ironic that a movement called realism is keeping it real by the fact that it is reminding us that art isn't real, that art is artificial. And he's sort of exposing art for what it is, which is fake, which is artifice. Kind of cool, right? Uh, but people didn't like this. They thought it was shocking. Um, this is a concept called truth to materials. And this is a concept that will that will have a big influence on modern art, but basically Truth to Material says, the, let the materials look like what they are. We don't need paintings anymore to look like, like reality because we, we can do that with cameras now. So we should just, what we should do is emphasize the inherent natural qualities of the materials we're using. Paint should look like paint. Paintings are also flat, so we should emphasize the flatness of them and not worry so much about linear perspective. In other words, let's celebrate those ma the materials for what they are and what they really look like. This was really radical stuff, guys. This is about as avant-garde as it could get at the time. 